meeting is being recorded. Cheers, guys. And yeah, welcome back, everybody. It's good to see so many people uh, here today, like we had last week. Um, so just before we get started, um, well, I was going to ask who was at session one. Is were there any, Was there anybody here that wasn't at session one? Anyone say in the chat? Well, most people kind of follow through from session one. Anybody new here? Yeah, we got a couple of people saying they weren't here. A lot of people okay. saying they were here. Perfect. Um, so a couple of things on that. We've got um, a YouTube channel, which kind of records all of our previous sessions. That's both external with kind of external speakers and also this internal investing 101 classes and kind of alpha room that we're running. Um, so yeah, that's the first thing. Second thing is that this is all going to be very basic. I wouldn't say that coming to 101 uh, last week was much of a prerequisite for this class. So that's really great news. Um, and this one will be recorded as well. So there's a lot of content tonight. If any of this is difficult, we've tried to explain it as easy as possible, but we'd recommend going to check out our YouTube channel and watching it back. Um, so first things first, yeah, Amrit and I are co-leading the session. I'm going to give myself a brief introduction because I, I did do it last week, but I thought I would introduce myself very briefly again, considering we've got some new people here. Uh, so my name is Henry Gardner-Roberts. Uh, I've just turned 22 and I'm third year econ uh, at Birmingham. Uh, most of my kind of financial experience has either been mainly doing mutual fund stuff, kind of investing in and on the buy side, uh, kind of picking stocks and that, but I've done some work at banks as well, uh, done some sales and trading and done some kind of financial analysis. And yeah, I manage my own portfolio, do some charity stuff on the side. Um, that's pretty much me. I'm gonna introduce Amrit now who didn't introduce himself uh, last week. So there you go, Amrit. Um, hey guys, so my name's Amrit or Amrit Powell. Um, so I'm currently, I'm 24. I'm currently a second year PhD finance student at UOB. Uh, my finance kind of research is focused on kind of sustainable development and like ESG and like those sort of policies related to kind of company performance. Prior to that, I worked as an economist in, uh, in the city doing uh, kind of research and reports into kind of the purchasing managers uh, index. So if you guys are aware, kind of these uh, manufacturing kind of releases every month that kind of affect the markets, um, I was the one writing them. And I was the one getting quoted in the Financial Times, getting told how uh, Italy's economy is not doing so well on a monthly basis. But that's kind of a, kind of a brief overview of what um, you know what I've done and why I'm here. Just uh, before we both get started, just one quick thing uh, for everyone: feel free if you want to have your camera on, uh, make some more engaging. If you've got a question at some point, either write it in the chat or um, let me know, and we can you can actually put your mic on and speak. And uh, feel free to take notes. There's no pressure, you know, listen, have fun. Uh, it's going to be a great session. So uh, enjoy. Um, yeah, that's a good point, actually, David. Last week, we had this kind of slide with kind of disclaimers and general stuff like that. But yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, just hammering that home. We're trying to make this as interactive as possible. So please ask questions as we go. I will do that every three or four slides as Amrit will. And we'll kind of get questions as we go. We want to make this discussion based. We try to make it interactive. Uh, disclaimer, none of this is financial advice, it's purely educational purposes. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all I wanted to say on that front. Let me just minimize you guys. There we go. So what's on today? So three main things, really. We're going to explain the different types of fundamental investing. Uh, that's the kind of main focus of today's session. Uh, we're going to go through the basic financial statements. You might be familiar with them if you've done like accounting or uh, investment internships in the past, but we're going to make that very, very basic. Uh, and then we're kind of going to do a deep dive on the financial ratios, which are based off these financial statements to kind of help you choose great stocks. Uh, I'll be running kind of the first uh, 15 minutes and then it'll be over to, to Amrit for some of the more technical stuff. Uh, and we'll both be kind of jumping in and taking questions as we go. Um, right. So let's get started. Uh, so I thought very briefly, I'll just recap the last point of the last slide, which was basically the... Um, differences between fundamental and technical investing. Uh, they're quite different. So fundamental was basically, it's more about analyzing the underlying business model behind the stock, you know, kind of looking at the financial statements. Um, yeah, you're looking at the actual asset that's tied to that stock. And it's usually more of a long-term strategy. Technical, that's more, much more about trading. It's much more about the underlying graph patterns and kind of the behavioral psychology. Uh, behind everything. And that's usually associated more with the short term, uh, although not always. Um, 
Yeah, and I brought that up because today is kind of a, a deep dive on the fundamental side of investing. Um, yeah, that's basically what it is. Financial ratios are, are much more looking at the actual underlying asset. And none of this is technical from the definition of trying to predict what the charts are going to do from a behavioral perspective. Um, but there will be sessions on that later on. Okay, so here we go. A wise man once said, I'd love to be able to predict markets and anticipate recessions. But since that is impossible, I'm satisfied to search out profitable companies as Buffett is. Uh, very wise words. Does anybody know who this man is? Anyone recognize him? He often has a dodgy haircut. No? We got a couple messages in the chat saying Big Pete, Peter Lynch. Big Pete. Someone calls him Big, yeah, that's him, Big Pete. Um, here we go. This is Peter Lynch. So he was an American investor, mutual fund manager, uh, actually kind of grew up on a, he grew up on a golf course collecting balls, was kind of his part-time job when he was younger. And that's how he got into stocks because, you know, rich people play golf and they talked about stock picks. And then he kind of bought a stock and it went up threefold. And then he kind of took it from there. Ray, Ray Dalio, who's one of the richest um, men in the world who runs a, a large hedge fund called Bridgewater, had a very similar story. But anyway, Peter Lynch was famous for managing a fund called Magellan. Uh, and that kind of has a track record as the best performing fund uh, growing. Yeah. Compounded average of twenty nine point two percent. Uh, from 1997 to 1990. Very, very impressive. It grew from 18 million to 14 billion. Uh, to be fair, he did have a bit of a bull market. Like the 80s was quite good in terms of, you know, the stocks were generally on a pretty good upward trend. Uh, but nonetheless, he's got the best track record. Uh, and he's got some good books, Beating the Street and One Up on Wall Street. Um, I've read the latter quite a lot. The former is still on my bookshelf, but... I'd highly recommend them both. One up, one up on Wall Street was really, really good. Uh, and he, he simplifies it for the everyday investor a lot. Uh, so that would definitely be one to put on the reading list. Anyway, the wider point of this is that he had a, a focus on the micro sentiment of stocks. What he was saying in his quote is, you know, breaking down the individual stock is much easier to predict than trying to predict the, the economy as a whole. Um, a lot of the time, you know, economists and kind of, uh, people who conduct kind of surveys and polls. Like it, it's a very, very complicated job. I mean, Am Amrit will tell you, right, just focusing on the whole um, manufacturing index is, is a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, so Peter Lynch's approach was much more micro. I'm sure everybody's heard of these, um, these terms. They're kind of widely used, you know, in kind of all, all across the sciences. But in economics, it basically means micro, small scale, individual company, individual person, et cetera, et cetera. Macro is much more focused on the big picture, you know, big economic trends. It's like psychology, micro, sociology, macro, for example. Um, and yeah, so micro is associated with something what you'd call bottom ups investment selection. So that would be going into the specifics first and thinking, I want this particular characteristic from a certain investment. Uh, whilst the macro is much more about thinking, I'll say, for example, um, you know, Biden got elected president. Biden is very uh, pro kind of renewable energy and environment. Biden might uh, put in a favorable tax policy for renewable uh, energy companies. Therefore, I'm going to base my thesis on that. And then I'm going to go down to the small companies and look at uh, stocks specifically in that energy industry. So that's pretty much that. Um, yeah. Does anybody have any questions on those first few slides? No questions in the chat so far. Um, you know, what I will do, Henry, is though, I'll put the link to our YouTube channel in there so that anyone that missed the first session can, after this session, then catch up on it. Um, just everyone's really up to speed with the whole fundamental technical as well. I know you've recapped it just now, but we'll sure. go through that again. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, so here we go. That, you know, people often ask, like, and this is kind of what cr comes down to the kind of crunch time, what we're talking about today. What do people look for that indicates a good business to invest in? A lot of this is quantitative, which comes from the financial statements, but a lot of it is kind of qualitative. And, I, you know, we'd really love to run a session on that later um, in the term. But today is much more of a quantitative approach. Uh, but a lot of the point is, is that this isn't always objective. Um, some of it is, is pretty objective. You know, obviously you want 
a good profitable company with a solid solid business plan but a lot of it is based off uh an individual's needs so for example say you've got oh that that shouldn't say fundamental versus technical by the way i don't know why it says that but just ignore that um so you've got jamie and ethel um these are two characters i made up let's say jamie is 24 uh he's earning 40k a year in the city and you know he's expecting his salary to go up and he's also started his portfolio. So he's not got the most capital behind him, but he's getting there. He's also single and he's got no dependents. He's got no, um, you know, people in old age dependent on him. He's got no children. Um, meanwhile, Ethel, you know, she's much older she, and she relies on the investments to kind of maintain her lifestyle um, as well as her state pension. And she has dependent children. Maybe she's got a dependent husband. And the point is, is that for these two people, the investment strategies might largely be different. Uh, this is kind of what a wealth manager would do. Uh, if you were someone who wanted to outsource your money to, every, to a lot of other people, um, you would, you know, the wealth manager would sit you down. He'd say, what's your tolerance for risk? Uh, do you have any dependents? What's your salary? What's your projected salary? How long are you likely going to live? Um, you know, do you have um, debt to pay on your car? Uh, how big is your mortgage on your house, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, how, you know, just a quick question for everyone. How might you think uh, the investment strategy would vary between these two people? Who would say want to take on more risk? So we've got, let's have a look. Jamie might take higher risks. Yeah, Eth Ethel's would be less risky. Jamie can be riskier. Um, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Exactly. Like Jamie can be a lot riskier because Jamie, you know, Jamie's young. He's got no one depending on him. Um, you know, he knows that his salary is going to go up year and year and year. And he's got a long time left to live. Like Ethel, she's very, very dependent on her investments. And obviously she wants to, she doesn't want to lose it all because she wants to pass on what she's built, you know, to her children and grandchildren. Um, so this leads into kind of the, the different kind of types of investing. And I wanted to explain this. So at least from a fundamental standpoint, You've got a few different kinds of investments here. You know, you've got you've got value. That's basically describing um, load up. There we go. That that's basically describing investments that are very very cheap uh, relative to the overall market uh, market prospects. It's a very quantitative measure. You know, you might build some complex financial model if you've heard of something called earnings power value, uh, discounted cash flow dividend discount model, uh, Graham's net nets. I know these are all complicated terms, but they're just example of models where people would say, I think these shares are valued at 150. They're investing in the market. They're trading in the market at 100. Therefore, let's buy these shares. We grow the capital gains and we sell at 150. That's basically what value investing is in a nutshell. You know, these shares are trading at um, 100 and your valuation models are coming out at 70. There's no point in investing in them because you don't think that they're worth that much. You know, why would you buy something for 100 that you think is worth 70? So that's basically value investing in a nutshell. Um, yeah, growth investing is slightly different. Uh, growth companies don't tend to be undervalued based off their kind of historic or current performance, but it's much more about their future expectations. You know, so you'll see um, a lot of companies with very high expectations being, yeah, very, very expensive on relative terms. Uh, but it's about trying to think about are these investment prospects fully reflected in the current market price? So for example, again, you might build a valuation model for Tesla uh, and it would say, oh, well, you know, the market is implying at this current share price that Tesla is going to grow at 50% a year. But if you think that Tesla is going to grow at 60% a year, Tesla might be a growth stock for you. So that's an example of growth. Um, and then lastly, income. So this might be much more what Ethel would go for, you know, being very, very dependent, she wants regular withdrawals. Uh, income is just about finding investments that generate a consistent uh, and reliable return. This is usually in the form of dividends. I explained this last time, like dividends are, um, are basically proportions of company profits that it, you know in, uh, shareholders will pay out uh, to investors. Um, you have very, they tend to be very mature companies that pay out dividends, you know, ones with stable earnings, stable cash flow that can afford a nice steady rise. So that's what, what Ethel might go for. You know, Jamie is probably much more on the growth side uh, where he can afford to take these more risks uh, and potentially obtain higher rewards. 
Um, yeah, any questions on that? Nothing in the chat. It might be just worth explaining, Henry, um, kind of what stocks are traditionally associated with, with the different types. So for example, you know, gross stocks could are usually um, tech stocks, or sorry, tech stocks are usually gross stocks or high yeah, growth sure. stocks. Um, I'm just going to that for a second and I'll, I'll go through another question we got on the chat. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so yeah, firstly on growth specifically, that's a good point, David. Like, okay, so if you think about um, the stocks, I'm trying to see if SharePad's open, it's not. Okay, but if you think about the stocks, they're at the top of the, uh, top of the US stock market today, top of the S&P 500, right? You've got Apple, you've got Microsoft, you've got Amazon, you've got Facebook, you've got Google. Um, those are pretty much the top five. How many of those were around 30 years ago? You know, none were around 30 years ago. Uh, Tesla, uh, Facebook didn't even IPO until 2012. Um, you know, Amazon and yeah, Amazon still don't pay dividends. Facebook still don't pay dividends. These are very much growth stocks. I mentioned those examples because David says tech is associated with growth. Um, and that's basically because, you know, tech stocks are growing very, very high. Um, they grow very, very quickly. And um, what you see is you see more of the share price reflective of future expectations rather than what's going on currently. Obviously, people are willing to pay more at today's price uh, for a stock that's going to grow quicker in the future. And that's kind of why you see uh, growth stocks not necessarily being value stocks, although they can be, um, but they're not always the same. Value stocks, you know, a lot of the time, these are companies that have been overlooked by the market. Um, so for instance, you might have a, a value stock in oil, for example, at the moment, you know, the oil price has been battered, uh, because there's been lack of demand because of COVID. Uh, so oil stocks have been battered and a value investor might go in and say, you know, the market, obviously they really don't like these stocks. Uh, but if we take all of the assets, all the oil company owns, we pay off all the liabilities. This is actually worth something compared to the average share price. So, so value stocks, not always, but they're often kind of neglected companies that have been out of favor and they've been growing, but the share price has kind of been flat. Um, yeah, that's kind of more, more value companies. And then income companies, as I said, they're usually much more mature. Uh, what I mean by that is that in order to, for companies to pay dividends, um, they usually have to be motivated where rewarding the dividends is of more benefit to them than putting the money back into the company. So the reason that you don't see uh, Facebook and Amazon pay dividends. The reason you don't see Google and Apple paying particularly big dividends um, is that because they're tech companies and they can grow at such high rates, um, you actually see them saying, well, why would we pay dividends where we can actually reinvest, grow the business even faster than the rate the dividends increasing, and then maybe pay out dividends five to 10 years in the future. So that's why you don't see it with very young companies, with very old companies that maybe can only grow um, somebody like Unilever who can grow at a few percent a year if they kind of invent new products, but really they're just going to grow not much faster than food demand, really. Um, and they're much better off uh, using their capital to pay out shareholders and reward shareholders rather than reinvesting it in the business. Uh, so those are those three in a nutshell. Uh, do you say we had a question, David? Yeah, we did. I think that, that kind of answers it. But okay. another, way, another way to think of the, uh, the value growth income the lot that's used is value companies tend to be ones that are, as you said beaten down you know at the bottom of their game and there could be value there uh, growth are the ones that are at the top of their game you know hitting the headlines the apples the teslas the netflix and then income are the ones that are just always there in the background you know the bps yeah. shell stuff like that um I, I don't know if that helps anyone trying to think about it but growth the exciting ones basically <laughs> Yeah, um, growth, growth's very exciting. And I, th I think particularly recently as we've kind of seen democratization of investing and all of us youngsters get involved, growth has been kind of much more popular uh, compared to value. Value has been a bit out of favor for the past 20 years. But yeah, fingers crossed it comes back into favor because I like value. Um, yeah, so that's basically everything on that slide. Um, Very quickly, before you, before you move on, if you don't mind, we've had one more question, which is yeah, go ahead. Point, is a really good one. What's the point of investing in a company that doesn't pay dividends? Oh, well, if so, okay, basically, um, so there's two ways you can really make money from a stock. It basically, there's many more complicated ways, but two basic ways. One, uh, they pay out dividends. Two, it would be the capital gain of the stock. Um, so that would be if you bought a growth stock for $50 that doesn't pay any dividends. 
Um, then the company grows and grows and grows. And then the share price is $100. And you basically make $50 or 100% off the capital gains. A lot, of, um, a lot of people actually, if they're really smart and re- have a really large time scale, they'll actually buy growth stocks um, with the objective that they're going to pay income stocks way, way, way. Sorry, they're going to pay dividends way, way further down the line. Uh, so that would be why someone who someone wouldn't, um, sorry, would invest in a stock that doesn't pay dividends is it's because of the of the growth and the kind of capital gain of the stock that would back that growth up um, with the eventuality that hopefully uh, they'll get paid dividends in the future. And that's where the shareholders will be rewarded. Good answer. And then we've had, if you don't mind, I'm sorry to, uh, to stop you from this. Like we've had, what happens if the future prospects of a growth stock don't end up as expected or they get delayed? Yeah, I mean, that's that's where things can go downhill very, very, very quickly. That, yeah. So, I mean, with a value stock, it's easy if it goes downhill, right? Because value investors are getting excited because they think, oh, the stock's going to be, you know, it, we can get it at even more of a discount uh, and then make more money if it goes back up. Income stocks, again, you know, as long as the company can keep paying their dividends, there's pretty much a floor on it because, you know, the stock price can only go so low before dividend investors get so excited that the dividend yield, which is the percentage of the dividend compared to the price, is so high, and then the stock will get bid back up. Uh, but with growth, yeah, because because the share price is much more reflective of future expectations, that's, yeah, with growth stocks, you'll see them collapse very, very quickly. Um, classic example, very quickly, uh, dot-com bubble, look it up, late 1990s. Um, you had stocks that were very, very much growth stocks, you know, stocks that weren't making a profit. They have ridiculous turnover numbers. There was a lot of accounting manipulation in the turnover numbers. And you would see these stocks get bid up to ridiculous prices. It was all growth. You know, it was barely any value, barely any income. Uh, and then when people realized that these companies weren't growing as fast as the market thought, yeah, the share price went down very, very quickly. And if you look at the effects it had on the overall S&P, it was absolutely amazing, absolutely catastrophic. Great, feel free to, uh, to go to the next slide. Awesome. Henry. Okay, uh, quick question. Does anybody know the three key financial statements? Anyone know? Anyone know what they are? Feel free to uh, turn on your mic and shout out if you know one of them or all of them. Okay, we've had in the uh, in the chat we've had income, balance sheet, and cash flow. Boom! Look at that right order: income statement, balance sheet, cash flow statement. Um, Right. So yeah. So these are three financial statements. Uh, This isn't going to be a deep dive on accounting. Uh, a tool accounting can get very complicated and very boring but it's one of those things you've got to put the effort in if you're going to be a good investor and at least know the basics you know you don't have to be line by line super duper uh, but it's important to know how these operate and how they link together Uh, okay so in layman's terms uh, probably the best way to explain this is to think about it in relation to our own everyday lives so your income statement That is your profit and loss, your revenues minus costs, what you make versus kind of what you spend. Um, That's analogous to kind of, um, you know, me going out and having a part time job and making 60 pound a day fixing bikes. Uh, And then kind of, you know, I spend uh, 20 pounds getting the parts of those bikes. Uh, And then at the end of the day, 40 pounds is kind of my net profit. Uh, So that's how the income statement works in real life. in terms of the cash flow statement, that's showing the cash coming in and out like a bank account. So I might make, so after all of that's been taken out, I've made 40 pounds net uh, from fixing those bikes. Uh, and then basically that show that means I can do whatever I want with it. I can uh, invest in a new bike. You know, I can invest in new uh, tools to fix my bikes. I can save up a load of 40 pounds and eventually go on holiday. Um, so that's basically what that's showing. Uh, And then the balance sheet, um, that is showing assets, liabilities. So that would show um, that would show my car as an asset. Um, My it would show well, it would show my house as an asset, but it would show any mortgage I had on my house as a liability. Uh, Biggest liability for most of us at the moment is student loans. If most people actually sat down and did their balance sheet, we would have negative net worth. So in terms of personal balance sheet, 
asset and minus liabilities is a net worth. And mo the reason why most of us would have a negative net worth is most of us took out student loans. Most of us, for most, for most of us, that's 27K plus maintenance loans. Um, yeah, unless you've kind of got 40K or plus in assets, then chances are you're, uh, yeah, you're in negative net worth. But, you know, uni, you know, adding to our human capital, hopefully that will change. Uh, so that's basically that. Uh, and these ratios, basically all of the ratios that Amrit is going to explain to find profitable companies, they all come from these statements, uh, which is why it's important to explain them. Um, yeah, I couldn't find this explained on the internet particularly well, um, but this is just a very, very, very simplified explanation of how they all work in conjunction. So you've got the, as I said, the income statement, I've got the revenue from fixing bikes coming in, uh, and then you've kind of got the cost of that, I and mean, then anything that I earn goes to the cash flow statement. Um, the net earnings from the cash flow statement, sorry, the net earnings from the income statement, and then what comes into the cash flow statement, they're not always the same. Uh, imagine if somebody said, okay, um, I'm going to pay you 50 pounds to fix my bike, but I haven't got it, uh, my 50 pound yet, I'll pay you 50 pound next month. So they do it on credit. Um, and it comes in as an accounts receivable that would show up on my income statement um, as I've earned the 50 pounds, but it wouldn't show up on my cash flow statement because that 50 pounds hasn't actually come in. Uh, so that's how that works. Your cash flow statement, as I said, it kind of shows what you spend it on. You spend it on assets and liabilities. You can buy assets, you can take on debt, and that goes into the balance sheet and it shows what you have and what you, what you owe. Um, and then from the balance sheet, you know, those assets and liabilities, uh, they enable the activity that produces revenue. Um, assets, obviously, you know, buying factories and, and whatnot, buying kind of general capital that goes back into the income statement. Um, but liabilities can also fund, you know, good revenue as well. If you're, uh, if you use them right, you know, if you take on debt and an ample opportunity, like us going to uni, right, we're taking on this debt now, so that hopefully we'll learn more than we ever have to pay back in student loans. It's kind of like that. It's kind of like an investment. Um, so that was kind of the question on that. I'll very quickly run through the three statements as an example, and then we can go through questions on that. Um, but very quickly, Walmart, this isn't by any means current year data. It's just an example of what a balance sheet might look like. You've got your kind of revenue coming in. You've got cost of that revenue. You've got the kind of the, the gross profit. Um, and then you kind of have, after all your admin expenses, you've got operating profit. You take off some, some tax. Um, you take off some other things, which Amrit will explain, and then you kind of have your profit at the bottom. That's how the income statement looks. On the balance sheet, again, it's assets and liabilities. Uh, you have current assets and non-current assets, which I think Amrit is going to go through. Um, and when you kind of take these away, you kind of have something called net worth or shareholders' equity. Uh, is kind of you is kind of the business equivalent of what the of what net worth is. Um, so that's kind of what a balance sheet looks like. Again, I'm not looking to explain these line by line now, but it's just to give you a general idea of what they look like. And then cash flow. So as I mentioned, that is very similar to what your bank account statement would look like. It kind of shows you what's come in from the business, what your net earnings are, uh, and then it kind of shows you how you spend the money. Uh, so the cash flow from operations is what you're uh, bringing in ultimately. Um, and then your net cash from investing is what you're kind of putting in back into the business. Um, yeah, what, what you're kind of investing on, you kind of plant property and equipment, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then net cash from financing is basically where you're kind of using the cash within the company to kind of do things. <laughs> Henry? Henry, you there? <laughs> is, uh, am, I, am I frozen or is Henry frozen? Henry's frozen. Henry's frozen. All right. Um, sorry about that. I think that Henry will... Uh, We'll be back. He's hopefully. just coming back now. All right, perfect. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. I must have been his Wi-Fi, but um, Henry, can you hear us now?
So it says he's uh, just connecting. So we yeah, give him. Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions up to this point just about the uh, three statements whilst we wait for Henry to come back? Feel free to uh, ask it via speaker or, or in the chat. No? Great. Um, Okay, we do have questions, great. Okay, um, I'm, I'm happy to take the first one if yeah, you want, and then you can take the second one, or we can do, <laughs> I can take both. Um, do you often check statements before buying stocks at some Aisha? Yes, 100%. Um, okay, Henry's back. Uh, checking the statements and kind of looking at um, what they're saying is, is a core part of fundamental analysis and is definitely something that, you know, any investor or uh, analyst at a big firm or even a small firm will be doing before um, buying a stock. It's crucial to kind of look at the financial statements and there. This is kind of what, why we're doing this is our second session is because it's such a crucial part of um, starting to invest. And the second thing is, where can you find these statements? Um, go on, go on <laughs> feel free. Um, well, it depends kind of, um, you can find them in a company's kind of annual reports, um, but if you wanted to find them electronically, you can go to kind of Thompson One on the university website, uh, that's free, or Bloomberg has it, or kind of any main data provider will uh, kind of have all this. But if you want to see it kind of all neatly kind of put in place, especially with the company's explanation for all these values, uh, annual reports are the best shout. And we've had a... Uh one more which is what specific things do you look for when purchasing a stock that's exactly what Amrit's going to be covering in the second half of this session is uh, looking at financial ratios and what they might show us and how that can lead to choosing a good stock Henry you're yeah. back hey guys yeah I'm back I, honestly I'm not sure what happened to my laptop it just shut down on me um, but yeah I, uh, I appreciate well I'm back now um, yeah, I mean, did I? How much of the cash flows thing did you hear from me? Did it was it pretty much covered or? Yeah, it was uh, until you started uh, repeating yourself, and it just kind of it blurred out. I think if, oh. I don't think you uh, explained free cash flow fully yet. Okay, sure. So just the very last thing before I hand over to Amrit is basically just um, so free cash flow. That's a kind of golden thing in investing, particularly value investing, because that means is that like. Once you've got the operating profit, uh, once you've kind of deducted all the kind of investment and capex that you kind of put into a business, uh, once the company issues all its own shares and pays its dividends, what's the, the, the cash left, you know? Um, the way you measure free cash flow is you have the operating cash flow and you take away basically all of the stuff that the business has to maintain its current um, position. So it, it's as a general rule of thumb, it's roughly... The, the net cash from operations minus the net cash from investing, although not always. Um, it, it's, not a, it's not a measure that's explicitly listed, uh, but it's very, very important. And as I said, yeah, capital expenditure is kind of the, the measure needed to maintain current business expenses. That's the free cash flow, you know. Companies can pay dividends with it. They can uh, issue new shares. Or they can buy back their own shares. Um, that's, a very, uh, that's a very lucrative thing for them to do. Um, and yeah, it, that, that's just the, the, the pure, pure bottom, bottom line. Um, and if a company generates a lot of free cash flow, uh, particularly relative to where it's trading, it's typically a very good investment. Um, right, so that's everything for me. I will kind of carry on uh, clicking the slides for you, Amrit, but if you kind of want to take over from here, mate. And uh, yeah, good luck with your half of the presentation, buddy. <laughs> All right, well, thanks, Henry. Uh, thanks, guys. So kind of before we actually go into the financial ratios, I just want to kind of talk about data sources. I know um, kind of we had a couple of questions on kind of, you know, where do we get these statements from and, you know, where do we get these values from? Well, here's where you get them from. So there's kind of um, there's three free ways we've got and there's one kind of, I guess, slightly expensive way to kind of access data. Um, so firstly, it's kind of Bloomberg and Thompson one. Uh, these are accessible just kind of via the library or via kind of the Alan Walters room on campus. For, um, also, interestingly enough, uh, Thompson One is uh, accessible kind of remotely, so just via the library's website. Um, second, or secondly, there's also the Words database. Um, this is kind of the Wharton Research like data services um, database, and basically, 
this is the gold mine. This is the gold standard. The university pays, I think roughly, it's insane. It's like 80 grand per person for a license or something crazy for this. It's got Bloomberg data, Thompson data, um, S&P CompuStat data, um, a bunch of data from around the world. And basically what this means is, to put a long story short, any stock in any country around the world, you can get the accounting data, the stock price data, um, data on kind of who kind of works there, uh, the board of directors, and, you know, everything like that, all for free because we're students. So I thoroughly recommend you guys kind of contact library services and uh, kind of, you know, get involved with these services. They're free, you know, you're a student, you're paying 9K anyway, might as well get something out of it. Um, so we've got just some questions. Um, so where do you access it? The Bloomberg, you can access at the library and in the Alan Walters building. It's a brand new building opposite the library. Um, and Words and Thompson One, you can access kind of remotely. Could you go to the next slide, please, Henry? So what is a financial ratio? Uh, people hear this term financial ratio, they get scared, they think it's lots of you know maths and stuff, but basically a financial ratio is just a number based on the relationship of two values in a company's financial statements, that's it. So it's, uh, it's just something divided by something or something times by something equals whatever this ratio is. What we're gonna be looking at in uh, kind of you know this talk um, is, Kind of four main types of ratios so profitability ratios liquidity slash solvency ratios valuation ratios and dividend ratios and uh, we'll explain them now so kind of next slide so profitability ratios let me get this out of the way so kind of just kind of what it says on the tin they analyze the ability of companies to kind of generate profits or their profitability level um, they can also do this relative to other factors such as kind of like revenue or equity or assets, etc. Um, and we'll go into detail with two main factors next. So there's two main examples, which are net profit margin and EBITDA margin. Um, and so we'll kind of go into an explanation of these two. So net profit margin, that is essentially, well, it's exactly net income of the company divided by net sales times by 100. Um, so to give an example, so let's say you are, let's say Henry, the budding cyclist entrepreneur. He's uh, fixing bikes all day. His net income after, let's say at the end of uh, 2020, his net income is £10,000. Let's say his net sales were £40,000. So therefore, his net profit margin is 25%. So we can say, Okay, Henry's business has a 25% net profit margin. So that means it turns 25% of all revenue into net profits. Let's say if we were going on a shopping spree, we wanted to buy kind of some cyclist businesses and we saw kind of a David's business. He's also a cycling entrepreneur, but he, uh, he made uh, 15,000 pound of, uh, of net income of 45,000 pound of sales. So we divide that through, we'd find that uh, David has a net profit margin of around 33%. So we'd go with David, and unfortunately Henry would be left without financing. But hopefully he should be, he should be fine nonetheless. So it tells you how effectively a manager runs a business. So we know now in this case, David's a far better cyclist, cycling entrepreneur than Henry. Um, so let's move on to the next one. Yeah, just on that point. So yeah, higher higher number is good. A higher number is better, obviously. Um, but with all these ratios, you kind of you don't want to look at any of them in isolation. Because David, he, he could be funded by, you know, debt. He could be 400% leveraged. So, yeah, on, on that metric, sure, David is, um, David is doing very well. Um, but, yeah, use them all in conjunction with each other to kind of determine a good company. 100%, um, Henry. I think, you know, the, these are just kind of guides. So, you know, at the end of the day, investment's always going to come with some sort of risk and you're going to have to make a decision. But, you know, you're going to make an informed decision if all of these ratios kind of go the same way that you're thinking. So another common way to determine profitability is EBITDA margin. Um, and I just want to kind of go into this term because a lot of people hear this term and a lot of people say this term. And I feel like it's deliberately used just in ways to kind of make you feel a little bit, you know, silly and just, you know, you don't really know what it's what it's about. EBITDA is just basically an acronym for earnings before interest, taxation, depreciation, and amortization. And basically, it just goes back to what uh, Henry was showing with the balance sheets. Um, 
if you take you know the company's earnings and then you add in um you know the you if you take the company's earnings and you before you start deducting kind of you know these financing expenses the taxes expenses the depreciation of uh, of all your goods and the amortization of all your debt it kind of shows your raw income and cash generation ability of the firm so it's kind of a very crude way of saying how much money cash can this firm actually um, generate another term is kind of operating income if you're kind of aware of that they're kind of very similar so EBITDA turnover or EBITDA margin is just whatever the EBITDA kind of value is divided by turnover times by 100. So very similar to kind of the profit, uh, net profit margin of the previous slide. So before we move on to the next uh, kind of ratio, does anyone have a, a question? Yeah, we just had it. I've got one privately uh, to me and then there's one in the chat. So the okay. first question is, um, how would you calculate EBITDA? And the second one is, what would be the purpose of EBITDA? As we have to, uh, as we do have to take into account the interest and tax, etc. Okay, so I'll answer the second one first because that's quite interesting. Um, you're hundred percent right that we have to that companies have to pay tax and they can pay interest. However, these can be manipulated and these can be um, these these are kind of relatively malleable. So a lot of companies actually they defer their taxes. So um, in the US, actually, it's a funny rule. You can defer your taxes indefinitely. So you can write the IRS a letter and you can say, I, will pr I promise to pay my taxes. I will eventually, eventually. Um, so if you don't pay your taxes this year and you say you promise to do it in a future year, you can use that money you would pay for tax. You can give it out to shareholders or use it for investments, et cetera. So it kind of analyzes what the company could do or what the company has before it can kind of you know, uh, mess about with its interest expenses, tax expenses to minimize them and uh, kind of, you know, just keep keep hold to as much of its uh, cash as it wants. Um, and the first one, which is where, where can we calculate EBITDA? Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so just literally what Henry showed with the uh, with the balance sheets. I mean, that's literally how I would do that. You would find the company's earnings on the balance sheet and then uh, you could either um, you could either actually just look at the company's balance sheets because uh, typically they would actually have that in their financial statements or you could literally just take their uh, operating income um, or their net where you could take their final kind of free cash flow and then you could add in all these factors so you could add in the interest you could add in the taxation expense instead of taking away all these factors you can add them back in and then eventually you'd end up with the uh, the EBITDA value. Henry do you have any you know, thoughts on that? Is that right? In that was opinion? that was greatly explained there. Yeah. All, okay. all I would say is that most companies, most public companies are kind enough to to list EBITDA margin on their income statement. And if it's not EBITDA margin, um, it'll be something called operating margin, which is similar, but that that's the same as EBIT margin. So it's the same, but just not with the depreciation. Um, so yeah, short answer is most companies will be kind enough to list it on their financial statements. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really crucial point that all these all these stats, you know, interest tax is always on the income statement um, earnings, as you say. So that's the first place to really look for, for these kind of uh, ratios. Yeah, D don't think from this presentation, all these calculations, you're going to have to kind of like sit manually with a book and kind of do EBITDA of a turnover with, you know, with, the, with your own calculator for all these different stocks, like the data providers that um, we went through a few slides ago. Uh, yeah, they can basically do all this shit for you. They're really, really impressive. Definitely. So uh, next slide then, Henry. Um, okay, so we've kind of got another one for um, return on it. This, see, I feel like this slide's kind of misplaced. This isn't profitability. Do you mind going to the next slide, please? Yeah, of course. Uh, okay, we're we This is the one I wanted. Um, okay, liquidity and solvency ratios. So um, I'm sure you guys have heard of the term kind of insolvent or solvency and liquidity. Um, it basically, so these ratios basically determine kind of how much, um, uh, how, how a company can actually, um, how credit worthy a company is effectively, like kind of can they pay their debts effectively um, and how much cash do they have to pay their short term debts and how much assets do they have to pay their long term debts. So could you go to the next slide, please, Henry? So we've got three main examples we're going to use. So the cash ratio, debt to equity ratio, and interest to coverage ratio. Um, and then next slide. 
So the cash ratio, as aptly put, is basically a ratio of how much cash you have to your debt. There's a, there's a kind of a key point in finance, which is when people talk about current and uh, non-current. Um, I think Henry mentioned this earlier. So when, uh, when we talk about current, we talk about stuff that's kind of due due to us um, in less than 12 months. So, you know, it's also another term for kind of short term. So short term debt in finance is debts that last less than 12 months. So if it's, um, well, you guys know what 12 months is, that's fine. So the most conservative measure that we have is a kind of cash ratio. And that's basically how much cash a company has uh, slash cash equivalents. So like treasury bonds or uh, money market funds, et cetera divide by the kind of debt that they have for 12 months, um, less than 12 months. So obviously you'd, uh, this is basically, you know, if, uh, if the short term creditors said to the company, you're not credit worthy, you know, we want our money back, you know, could the company actually pay its short term debts? Would it need to raise any debts? Would it need to sell off any businesses or sell off any assets? And as you guys know, when you have to sell something, it takes a bit of time. So this is kind of, you know, the short term freedom of that company. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Or, okay, so this is a uh, debt to equity ratio. This is kind of more broad. It's traditionally used as uh, kind of a very comprehensive measure of kind of solvency for a company. So, and it literally is total debt divided by total equity. And uh, basically this kind of measures if a company is financed in its operations through debt or equity. And it shows the ability of kind of the shareholders to equity to cover kind of any debts in the case of like, I don't know, a recession, et cetera. Um, so kind of one point I wanna make about this is, so there's, there's two ways you can finance a company. You can either take on debt, so you can borrow, uh, borrow money from, if you're a small company, you'd probably borrow it from a bank. If you're a large company, you'd raise uh, you know, money on the debt markets, you know, you'd float um, you know, a bond issue, et cetera. Um, if you're, um, and so, so that would be kind of the debt-based funding. And then secondly, you could kind of raise money through equity. So if, uh, you know, if you guys are aware, there's kind of, you know, uh, shares rights issues that companies would issue. So um, let's say Apple decides to sell kind of, you know, 500 million more shares. So therefore it's diluting down its share base. It's increasing number of shares that it has in the market. People want to buy that because they like Apple. Um, and, and yeah, that's just kind of, you know, those, uh, those main factors. The, the issue with those is that, when a company goes insolvent or when a company you know, goes bust, the people who, uh, who kind of have given money to the company get placed in a big long queue and whatever money the company has gets doled out to those people. However, it's done in an order and the uh, debt holders of a company. So if you're in a bond of like, let's say a defunct company, um, they, their number, you know, they're closer to the top and the equity holders are right at the bottom. So because of that, you know, this, uh, this ratio is quite interesting to see if there was a, you know, a downturn in the markets and a company did go insolvent, you know, could, the, uh, could the investors actually you know, get their money back from the debt or from, uh, you know, from kind of the insolvent company? I hope that makes sense. Henry, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, I was considering it, but I think it's too complicated. So yeah, okay. well explained, mate. All right, okay, next slide, please. So interest coverage ratio. Now this is a favor of uh, many people um, and definitely a favor of myself. Um, it basically, you know, it just basically shows the ability of a company to pay their interest bills. It's actually commonly used with, uh, with country risk analysis and kind of like broader economic analysis to determine kind of credit worthiness of co uh, countries as a whole. And essentially what it is, is uh, the earnings before interest and taxation. So in this case, we have EBIT and not EBITDA. We don't uh, we don't look at the depreciation or amortization uh, divided by the interest expense of that company. So if it, it shows that if uh, if a company has kind of you know very high interest uh, payments per year, they're going to have um, you know they're going to have a harder time using their operating income to pay that. Um, does anyone have? So this kind of brings here to the end of kind of the solvency issue or solvency ratios. Does anyone have any questions or David, do you, have you got any? We did have one in the chat. Um, I think it was actually about your previous point um, about US companies paying taxes. So the question is from Assel, which is, uh, doesn't a US company have any obligations before they can defer their taxes indefinitely? Oh, no, see, this is the thing. This is why um, it's, um, 
basically to answer your question, no, they don't. So there's a, it's a really, really interesting rule. Um, any corporation can do this as well, but basically you, it's just in the, in the tax rules of the US, they, um, companies are allowed to defer their taxes. And as long as they, you know, as long as they kind of report it and they report it as, um, you know, a kind of long-term debt that they have to the government, they can continue doing that forever. Great. Um, I'm conscious of time, but we have had one really important question from James, which is how do we know if the ratio is, is good, you know, or if it's high, like what, what kind of markers are there for, for each ratio so okay. that we know? Definitely. I, th I think in, in terms of time, we'll just choose the ones that we've done um, currently. So if we start interest coverage ratio and then we'll work backwards and I'll just tell you what's the good thing and bad thing. So cool. for interest coverage ratio, um, you know, basically the higher the value, the better. Um, I'm sure you guys, you know, can can figure that out, but let's work together. So um, if you've got, let's say, operating income of, you know, a thousand pounds and you've got 200 pounds of interest expense, then you've got a ratio of five. If you've got operating income of, you know, 200 pounds, but your interest expense is 200, your operating, uh, your interest coverage ratio is one. And then if it dips below one, you're basically saying, I can't fund uh, my my current debt. I have to borrow money to pay off my debt. Um, so you know, then the markets actually uh, consider you going into kind of like a tailspin because your your current operations are not sustainable to pay off any debt. So to answer your question, uh, the higher value, the better. Uh, typically, if, uh, in general terms, I believe a value of two or more is kind of you know as uh, getting there, getting good. And then less than one is uh, is not good. And then cool. if we go backwards. Just to add to this one quickly. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of things that depend on us. Like le the leverage of the firm is important. Like if the firm is, if the firm has a good reason to, to have loads of debt and is growing quickly, then I'd be comfortable with two as an investor. If there's no reason for them to be in a lot of debt, like if, they, if it's not debt to fund growth, then I'd like to see a much higher, you know, three, four, five would be better. I guess the key thing is that like, if you do have one of those high companies that's growing, very, very quickly, and you're seeing a very low interest coverage ratio below three, um, you know, is, is the interest coverage ratio going down? You know, if a firm have sustained a interest coverage ratio of 1.5 for five years, that might be a right. But if it's going down, you know, five, four, three, every single year, you're probably going to run into a bit of trouble. I think um, Henry kind of raised a really interesting point. So like guys, when you look at a ratio, um, uh, when you look at any ratio at all, and to be fair, even when you look at like anything in terms of finance, you want to look at the trends. You want to look at what's going on last year. What, what happened five years ago? What happened with the market as a whole? You know, what happened with the industry as a whole? And you want to say, okay, is my company, my company might be bad now, but has it, you know, was it really bad in the past and has it improved? Or is it, you know, even though it's, uh, it's, you know, really bad now, is it better than the average market? Is it better than the industry? Is it better than, you know, other geographies, et cetera? So you always want to kind of think critically and kind of uh, evaluate according to kind of other, you know, comparisons. Can I very, very quickly add to that? Is that all right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it's really important to put these ratios into context, as you're saying, you know, for example, a small, fast growing company might uh, start off by borrowing a lot of money, which means it's going to have a lot of debt, but that doesn't mean it's a bad company. You know, it might have a really bad debt to equity uh, ratio, but it needs that debt to be able to grow. Um, so, you know, you can't, you've got to put everything into context when you're looking at, you've got to look at the bigger picture. 100% David, I think um, like a, lo a lot of it is you've got to start with an investment like thesis. You've got to think, okay, I want to invest in Zoom because all the, you know, because of this continuing work from home, uh, you know, work from home stuff because of all this COVID stuff. I think it's, you know, got a very low marginal cost. Um, it's, you know, very high margins, et cetera. And then you're going to zoom in and then you're going to uh, look at all these ratios. You're going to see, okay, what's their trends over time? Are they positive? Are they better than their peers, et cetera? But it's all going to feed into your investment thesis. So nothing is good or bad necessarily as long as it kind of corresponds to what you're feeling for the stock and what it kind of shows in reality, then you can kind of make a decision and invest. Sounds good. Um, um, Amr, do you want to do the specific numbers for the ones going forward so we have time to do the rest of the content? Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, just um, oh, yeah, time. just for, so time. Um, okay, cool. I'll do the numbers super quick. Then. Okay, so okay, lovely. Uh, 
if we okay we're doing do you want to do, the, do you want to do them all really quickly yeah, yeah I'll, right. I'll do them like super quick okay cool right. so here we go okay um net profit margin higher the better um what you want to do is you want to take your industry and then if it's above your industry level um then that's good basically so if your industry level is five percent and you get five percent or more it's a, it's uh a, that's favorable that's it next yeah. slide above 10 is usually good 100%. Um, again, same thing, same principle with this one. Um, check your industry. Uh, again, Henry said, I guess, you know, average guide, you want to say kind of, you know, 10% is good, but it this depends one, on what. This one's much higher. Like if, if it's, if it's mm. above 20, probably good. 100%. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, oh, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a not actually a slide we want to look at for okay. a moment. Um, Okay, so cash ratio, same thing with the other debt ratio. We want to look at anything below one, uh, not so good, but there has to be kind of a reason. So the company might have invested, etc. Um, so the higher the figure, the better in this case. Yep, exactly. Yeah, uh, above 1.2, again, it's usually okay. Okay, and same thing here, debt to equity. Um, this one is very variable, yeah. isn't it? It very much depends on whether the company's in a ultra growth phase or it's kind of flatline phase. A hundred percent. So this, it's not really, this is kind of used to determine kind of, uh, I guess you'd probably look at this company and if you're unsure whether it was like a growth company or a value company, you could look at this and you could kind of determine, uh, kind of determine that. So, um, but yeah, I guess next slide. Interest oh, yeah, we did that. We did Valuation. That. Okay. Valuation. Okay, cool. So um, kind of as it says on the tin, tells you how expensive uh, a company is. The lower the ratio, more attractive a company becomes. Uh, this is because when you want to buy a company, we want a cheap deal and we want to buy it. And then we want the value to go up over time as the market discovers how great this investment is. Um, next uh, slide, please. So we've got two main kind of ratios, price to earnings and price to uh, free cash flow. Uh, next slide. So we've got price to earnings ratio, which is determined by current share price divided by earnings per share. Earnings per share is in turn determined by the net income of the company divided by the number of shares. So, um, but yeah, so I guess basically kind of without going into the mechanics of this, this uh, determines kind of the relative, I guess I put it the relative value of these shares but Henry, do you have a do you have a better way, a more simpler way of putting this? Well, I just, I just say say the price to earnings ratio was eight. It take mm. you eight. It take you eight years uh, to build up the net profit uh, to get back to where you initially bought the shares. So price to earnings ratio of eight would mean for every one hundred pound of stock, you'd be earning twelve point five of net profit every year. That doesn't mean you're getting paid by that in dividends, but that's the net profit of the company. If the company was was static and kind of um, you know grew at zero and earned the same every year, it'd take you eight years to recoup your, your what you earned in shares. Um, and then in terms of the valuation for this, it's much on a relative basis, really, really on a relative basis. Tech stocks massive, um, you know, consumer defensive stocks pretty low, uh, utility stocks very low. I would say look at the PE of the stock compared to one the market to the five-year median average, like the previous five years of the actual company, and three, the industry. Okay, um, 100%, Henry. Uh, next slide, please. So we've got price to free cash flow. Um, this is basically the company's market cap divided by their free cash flow. And similar to kind of price to earnings, um, it kind of determines kind of how much, I guess, raw cash the company has um, in relation to kind of the company's value. So if it's kind of very low, then we want, we're interested in that because then we're gonna get a quicker payback time, I guess, for uh, kind of our, our investment in this company. Um, and, and yeah, uh, do you got anything to add, Henry? I would just say, honestly, I'm absolutely obsessed with this ratio. It's the most important thing. It, to be fair, it pretty much is the most important thing. Like, as I mentioned earlier, you know, you've got the actual operating cash flow coming into the business minus the capex that you need to keep the business constant it is absolutely vital um and yeah like the price to earnings about how much net profit you're going to get back you know the, the the example i just used this is a this is the proper extension of that like because that free cash flow the shareholders are entitled to it the business don't need it to maintain current operations as i said the business can pay you back in dividends uh which most of them do 
if their Q3 cash flow is consistent and growing. Uh, they can do share buybacks, which is a topic for another day, but that also rewards shareholders. Uh, and they can they can reinvest in new projects that are not about business maintenance, but they can, it, it'd be like um, Facebook going, or they could do acquisitions. That's another thing they can do. They can go and buy businesses and integrate them. Um, so yeah, price of free cash flow is my favorite thing in the world. And again, look at it on a relative basis um, because it's all about the relative growth of the industry. Compare it to market as a whole, uh, compare it to industry and compare it to where the business is. If you don't want to go into building free, like free cash flow models and that, um, and you want to kind of see if a business is cheap, look at the business's growth compared to its price to free cash flow ratio. Say, for example, if the business has been growing, it's turnover at 5% a year, right? Um, but its price to free cash flow is the same, or maybe the price to free cash flow is, is, is lower. You know, you got back three years ago, it was 10. Now it's trading at seven, but the turnover and the profit is still growing. That indicates this business is undervalued on a relative basis to its past. Definitely, Henry. Um, okay, guys, so only, only kind of a, a couple more ratios left, so just five more minutes. Thanks for kind of uh, holding in there. Um, hopefully you found it interesting. Um, so lastly, we're going to look at dividend ratios. These measure basically the uh, dividend payments of a company relative to factors such as like earnings, uh, market value of its shares, etc. Two main examples, free cash flow and dividend cover. Can we go to the next slide? Yep. Uh, so free cash flow is um, basically your cash from operations minus your capital expenditures. Henry explained it earlier on in the call, but essentially it is kind of the raw cash that's um, available after all the kind of business operations, after everything, the cash in the bank account. And then from this, the company can uh, return this capital to investors through dividends. So very important to kind of, you know, get, you know, the higher free cash flow, more money available for uh, acquisitions or dividends, et cetera. Uh, can we go to next slide, please? Uh, lastly, dividend cover. And so this is the uh, dividend payments of the company divided by net income. And uh, essentially, just like we have um, kind of the ratios for just the other previous ones, we want to have a figure of kind of two or more so that we know that if, um, you know, we, we know that a company can comfortably pay the dividend payments for this year and uh, can continue to even grow them in the future. Um, so that's, uh, can we go to the next slide? Is that everything? That's everything. Yeah, that's, um, that's it. Can I, I can add one point to this. 100%. So yeah, I, the same way that I would extend um, price to earnings, I usually extend this in my analysis. So I go from dividend cover, which is also called earnings, earnings cover. I think it's called, uh, yeah, I think it's called earnings cover as well. Yeah. Um, I extend that to free cash flow dividend cover. Uh, so basically you've got, yeah, let me just hammer this point home about net profit and free cash flow and how they relate. So net earnings go to operating cash flow, which is the top line of the cash flow statement. The reason that they might differ is for a number of reasons. But as I said, you know, companies might claim things as net profit that they haven't actually received in cash yet. Say, for example, in my bike company, um, I have uh, orders waiting. Uh, I'm waiting to be paid by this company, 30% of my profit, but it's not coming as cash yet. What if that company go bankrupt and they can't pay me and I don't have the insurance or whatever to, to deal with that? The free cash flow, sorry, the, the cash flow in general is it can't be manipulated by cheeky accountants the same way that earnings can. Um, so that's why operating cash flow is important for calculating free cash flow. And as we mentioned a million times, the free cash flow calculation looks like this. After all of the expenditure is done to keep the things in the business, the free cash flow is there. And that's what the um, investors can use to reward shareholders. Free cash flow dividend cover. I mentioned this in the chat right after session one because somebody asked me about it. Like, if you see it above one, that is fine. If it's one, it's okay. It just means that the company is using all of its cash, its extra cash, to pay back shareholders and they don't have any room to do acquisitions or buybacks or or reinvest in new projects. You, you don't want to see a fast growing company with a free cash flow dividend cover of one. You want to see it a bit higher. Uh, if it's below one, that's trouble because where's the money to pay dividends coming from? It's not coming from free cash flow. It's going to come from burning through cash. It's going to come from debt. Um, so that is basically my ultimate thing. And in IPG, uh, the, key, the, the key point, well, one of the key points about them not covering the dividend was the fact that they're 
um, free cash flow, dividend cover, it's still quite high. Um, it was about 1.3. And the reciprocal of that is you'll see something called the dividend payout ratio, which is basically one over whatever the uh, free cash flow dividend cover is. Yeah. Hey, great, guys. I'm just going to um, wrap up if that's all right with you guys. Yeah, yeah. It's all right if I do the conclusion slide and then we can go for questions. Yeah, of course. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah that's fine. Um, yeah, so thanks for today's session, guys. Um, in conclusion, we've kind of explained the different types of fundamental investors, what personal factors might influence their decisions, like the, uh, what was it, Jamie and Ethel, I think I used as an example. Discuss the key financial statements, income statement, balance sheet, cash flow statement. Um, and then, yeah, Amrit's done an amazing job on explaining the ratios uh, and kind of how they all link together and what we kind of look for for a good investment. Perfect. Let's go for questions. Right. So firstly, thank you, Henry. Amrit, great session again. Um, so good to see, you know, we had over 75 people tonight um, at different times, which was fantastic. Great engagement, great questions going through. Um, one thing that I will just point out to everyone that's still here is that obviously um, that's a lot to cover in one hour session. And I appreciate you all staying. Um, I think what we'll do is maybe next week, we'll go into a bit more detail about how those ratios used in practice, give some examples, because it's clear that there's a lot of interest in that. Um, it's very hard to kind of get that all across and cram it all into one session, as I said. So we'll definitely look to uh, put it on for you next week if that's something that you're interested in. Um, but again, thank you all for your support. Um, it's going to go onto our YouTube tomorrow, this session, so you can rewatch it then and kind of take uh, break it down a bit, a bit slower, just to recap um before we open up for any quick questions i know we're running over but we have a, an amazing event on thursday night which is uh a guest speaker called denise kayadelin from ey who is a recruiter there she's going to be talking about the application process for financial firms and different firms uh how you can kind of get ahead how you can you know do well in the tests and the interviews um basically her top tips and her advice and her experience from her career. So if you want to sign up for that, please do. It's going to be a sellout event. And that is the link in the chat there for you to go sign up on Eventbrite. Um, definitely go do that ASAP. And yeah, if anyone's got any questions, quickly drop them in the chat. Um, we can get them. Ask the Henry and Amrit if you need to go, feel free. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, but yeah. Uh, we've, got some, we've got some questions, yeah? um i think it's too listed yeah we do have okay we've got a couple. firstly it's more of a logistical one which is are the sessions the same time every week they probably will be 6 30 on a monday uh at least up until christmas um what else have we got how do we access databases in the library is it installed on all computers so as far as i'm aware there's only one bloomberg terminal in the library and there's there's even a room called the bloomberg room is that right if Henry Amrit, do you know? Yeah, that's yeah, it. Correct. Yeah, it's correct. The, mm -hmm. it, the, the software is so powerful, you need specific computers and specific keyboards to use it. Yeah. So, so that's with the uh, the Bloomberg. However, Thompson One and Words, uh, you can access remotely any PC anywhere anywhere in the world. You just need to log in. Um, so, I strongly recommend just go to the library uh, or contact library services, um, get your login details, and then yeah, you can log in and access it. Yeah, um, we've got another one, which is how do, how do the taxes on stocks and dividends work exactly? Is that something that you, you can cover very quickly or is that something we should maybe cover next time? It's not that um, difficult. But no, what, gotta, is he talking personal that. taxes or is he talking company taxes? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, assume it's, uh, I assume it's corporate taxes. No, personal taxes. I would, okay. have thought, I would have thought it was personal, but yeah. Personal taxes. Personal taxes. Um, I don't know. I'm not quite sure, to be honest with you. I guess um, if it's in an ISA, it's tax free. If you, um, but there's also, um, oh, okay, all right. I it, okay. I, go on, go on, Henry. I feel like you'd know it's more than me. Cap, yeah, capital gain. It's called capital gains tax. It's the same thing, taxable on um, dividends and capital gains. You can basically, yeah, as um, Amrit said, ISA exempt from tax. You can all go put up to 20 grand a year in an ISA tax free. You can withdraw it tax free uh yeah capital investment capital appreciation on stocks tax-free income on dividends tax-free um and then if you get above that threshold the 12.5k a year you start paying capital gains tax which i believe is still 20 percent uh i've never paid capital gains tax in the uk but i believe it's a flat tax of 20 percent 
above a gain of about 12K. But let me just double check that if my memory doesn't fault me. So capital gains tax, gov.co.uk. Um, what you pay it on? I know what I pay it on. Yeah, so basically it's um, it's better. Oh, here we go. Capital gains allowances. Yeah, here, so yeah, exactly. It's exactly that. So the allowance, the capital gains tax-free allowance is 12.5K. If you make less than 12.5K, then you don't pay any tax. And then the tax rate uh, is 20%. Yeah, I got it right. Okay, so yeah, 12, up to 12.3K and then 20% flat tax on top of all of that. Different from income tax, which is hence why you should get into this shit rather than getting a job. Uh, income tax is progressive. So the more you earn, the higher residual tax brackets you have to go up to. Um, and yeah, that, that's pretty much it. But if it's uh, if you guys go for an ISA, you'll be exempt from those taxes. Yeah, perfect. I think that is all for tonight. Um, again, another, I think there was a really complicated question about something. Uh, hang on a minute. Is it, yeah, um, so you start paying capital gains tax when you have a bunch of money. You, you will pay it in a brokerage account if you, um, if you aren't in an ISA, but if you go for an ISA, you can be exempt from capital gains tax. Yeah. Henry, just because we're 15 minutes over now, we're going to have to end the session if that's all right. But if anyone's got any questions, put them in the WhatsApp chat, send us an email. Um, we're going to send the slides out to you because as we said, we know it's a lot that we've had to cover, but fantastic session, Amrit and Henry. Please, everyone, <laughs> I know everyone will be uh, grateful for the session you've run. It really was fantastic. And we will try and cover everything that we've done tonight in a bit more detail next week, if, if that's all right. Henry, Amrit, down Let's for do that. It. Yeah. Good Let's do examples. Right. In the meantime, drop us a follow on social media. Um, if you're not a member of our society already, please uh, <laughs> join us. It's free, it's easy. Follow our blog, uobinvest.org. Um, we post three times a week and it's great. There's good stuff on there, which will help you boost your commercial awareness. Any questions, drop us an email, message, anything. We're, we're around 24-7. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much all for, for tuning in tonight and hope you enjoy. Take care, guys. Cheers, Henry. Cheers, Amrit. Happy investment session.